We never get tired of hearing the surprising valuations on the Antiques Roadshow. It's always enthralling, and we love it. This cherished item was brought by the owner's great-grandfather, who worked as a buyer for Gimbel's in the late 1930s when he returned from an overseas travel. Acquired in 1936 or 1937, this chair, initially thought too costly for a child's toy by Gimbel's, was actually a salesman's sample. It's a salesman's sample, meaning that it's a small version of what would normally be a normal-sized chair. The design, dating back to the mid-1930s, captures the essence of the machine age with its sleek curves and streamlined aesthetic, departing from the bulkier chairs of the past. The chair had a brief production span from 1930 to about 1940, since World War II began. This salesman sample chair is a great piece for modern collectors. They're willing to pay its price in an auction. Auction today, you're probably looking at for this chair in the $2,000-$2,500 wow. range. This is a Seamaster watch, a waterproof round button Omega inherited from the owner's stepfather. It's a post-World War II chronograph with distinctive round buttons, indicating a design shift for waterproofing. Before the war, okay. they used flat buttons, and after the war, they did round buttons. And what they did is they took the watch from the flat buttons and they made them waterproof. Manufactured in 14 karat gold, likely for export to the United States, Watches like these were utilized in TV shows or radio programs. The estimated auction value for this rare piece is unbelievable. In an auction, mm -hmm. it would bring about $3,500. Oh. The retail level, fixed up, restored. It's quite expensive to restore a chronograph. No, really? It's, it's okay. expensive process. But when you do, it probably bring about $5,000. Holy oh, so. <laughs> You're kidding me. This artwork, created in 1959, is a watercolor and guashi painting by Jimmy Ernst, obtained by the owner as a gift from her husband's drawing professor, who purchased it directly from Ernst during the artist's mural work in Nebraska. The owner received it with the number 20 on the back, possibly indicating a $20 purchase price. This piece has a historical context as Jimmy Ernst, son of the renowned surrealist painter Max Ernst, who played a significant role in the art world. Born in Cologne, Germany, Jimmy later moved to the United States, working at MoMA and serving as Peggy Gungenheim's personal assistant. So at that time, he finally decided he wanted to become a painter, but he would do it in his own way. With a growing interest in decorative arts from the 1950s, Jimmy Ernst's work surely is valuable. The value would be $5,000. That's nice. This glamorous handbag was given to a mysterious person from London to the owner's mother-in-law despite not knowing anyone there, along with several items they got in the safety deposit box from the bank. We've not a clue where it's come from, who's left it. Is this gold handbag purse possibly from the 1920s? Although it's made of solid gold, the elegant handbag still has a soft texture and the segments open smoothly, revealing 9.3 carat mark inside. This gold handbag purse is estimated to have a value of four to six thousand pounds. It's not bad. Yeah, it's very good. The owner's husband co-founded FiberTech, a company specializing in fiberglass work. Wendell Castle, the highly regarded American wood furniture craftsman, approached her husband to manufacture chairs. These chairs, created around 1969 to 1970, are recognized for the unique design and limited production. The chairs, particularly the molder chair and the castle, exhibit features such as a molar-like shape and a colorful design with a rubber gasket along the bottom. Despite the knockoffs made in the 80s, the chairs are verified to have pressed fiberglass construction by inspecting the underside. The appraiser estimates the value of these items to be between $1,200 and $1,800, with the black one potentially slightly less. Wow. This is a collection related to the first series of Star Trek. And the owner's father, a nuclear physicist, became involved with a colleague from the nuclear program headquarters in New Mexico, sent him a letter with a pitch. The document, originated from March 1964, is Gene Roddenberry's typed pitch to DeSilu Productions, describing the show as the wagon train to the stars. Roddenberry wanted the science to be accurate, as indicated by his use of the Drake equation. The owner's father, being a scientist, noted corrections for the formula. 
We have notes here. Temporary get correct formula. Mm -hmm. When he was sort of a real stickler for science and he knew that he would be too picky and he wouldn't let some things go by. And secondly, he really didn't think it would go anywhere. The estimated value at auction for the document is four to six thousand dollars. But not having another one to compare it to and not knowing how many are out there, uh -huh. it could go for ten to fifteen thousand on the day. Additional items in the collection, such as the original script and Roddenberry's letter, adds to its overall worth, with the script selling for two to three hundred dollars and the letter for one hundred to one hundred and fifty dollars individually. My stars. These items were acquired by the owner at a garage sale and are linked to the silent screen star Clara Bow. Among the pieces is a Cartier Hermeto purse watch, meticulously handmade with enamel detailing and features Clara Bow's name. There's also an anklet given to Clara Bow by her lover, Warren Burke. A small note was also found inside revealing a message from Daniel Freeman to Clara Bow on her 22nd birthday, dated July 29th, 1928. He stole these items yeah. from Clara Bow. You won't believe how much these items were valued. Three to four thousand dollars for the wow. whole series. Wow. <laughs> this hat belonged to the owner's grandfather, a Muck Tony hunting club member in Clark County, Kentucky. The owner found a picture of him wearing the hat during a Rocky Mountains and Colorado trip with the Muck Tony in 1878. That is a notable piece as it was made by John B. Stetson when he was alive, specifically the classic model known as the Boss of the Plains from the 1870s and 80s. The hat brand is crafted from braided horsehair with a German silver button resembling a Texas Rangers badge, popular during that time period. The owner has also bought an unfinished Elcor scraper, likely from an Indian group. It's estimated that the hat's minimum value is $600. The hat band itself is considered valuable, possibly worth $300 to $400. Wow. This instrument was left in the owner's house when they moved in 1964. This is believed to be an Asian guitar or shamisen, specifically a late 19th century Chinese example called a sansian, played by young women during tea ceremonies and banquets. The instrument features rosewood veneer on the south board, clad in snakeskin and various intricate details such as inlaid floral patterns and a stylized vase on the fingerboard. The instrument remains largely intact despite some losses, chips, and age-related cracking. A conservative auction estimate would be between three and five thousand dollars. Okay. Wow. The owner's mother, who studied architecture and design, discovered this set in a classified ad in the Detroit News. The furniture set is called Malittle and was produced by Knoll International from 1966 to 1968. The designer behind this line is Roberto Mata, a Chilean artist known for paintings that sell for millions of dollars. The Melita line features polyurethane foam with a con covering, showing the experimentation with new materials during the 1960s. Similar sets in better condition can retail for around three to $3,200. But unfortunately in this condition, with the staining for about half of that, about 1200 to $1,500. The owners started to collect these at the age of 12, acquired outside team hotels and on trains rather than outside the grounds. The owner built an impressive assortment of autographs from notable football players. The owner even worked part-time for Charles Buchan, contributing to an article about the collector in Charles Buck's Football Monthly. The collection spans numerous albums, with the owner also selling autographs on the grounds for approximately a penny. The collection includes autographs from iconic players such as Les Medley, Stanley Matthews, and many others. Although the collector expresses hesitance to sell due to the sentimental value, the items estimated a potential value of between six and 8,000 pounds for the collection. Thanks for listening to it. Uh, very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. This owner has bought these pieces of jewelry from a car boot sale for a cheap price. The necklace, a 22 karat gold chain with emerald stones, was originally bought for three and a half pounds. 800 pounds wow. for this one. So the 18 karat gold pennant with diamond at the center was bought for two pounds. You're looking at about a thousand pounds. So the 18 karat gold flower brooch with three beautiful diamonds was bought for three pounds. Eight to 1200 pounds. The owner bought the exquisite sapphire flower brooch for a pound because it was broken. They were made in about 1900, 1915, Great. and they were once shirt studs. You'd probably be looking at about three to four thousand pounds. Well, one of the 18 karat gold rings was bought from a shop 25 years ago for one and a half pounds. The ring looks pretty much like an Allen Guard jewel. 
um, he's one of our you know best postmodernist jewelers you'd it's... be looking again at about three to four thousand pounds <gasps> this jewelry collection is indeed unbelievable what <laughs> good <laughs> grief these Masonic chairs, comprising the Masters, Senior Wardens, and Junior Wardens chairs, are believed to showcase the Harewood White style, and likely date back to 1780 to 1790. The design, with its curved back rail, acanthus leaves, and Prince of Wales feathers, is reminiscent of fashionable London styles in the 1780s. The large chair is estimated to be valued around 7,000 pounds, while the two smaller, slightly different chairs may be worth 10,000 pounds. Another interesting item presented is a unique auctioneer's gavel with a whistle, dated March 1877, passed down through the owner's family from their great-grandfather, who was an auctioneer. It must be worth well over a thousand pounds. They want it. <laughs> the owner, who is also a painter, has collected a group of astounding artworks. The Walter Sicker drawing shows technical brilliance and character. That's why, and I think actually everything you have here has character. The Augustus John drawing is characterized by its expressive style. And at his best, he's wonderful. The next painting was created by a private and deliberate naive artist, Patrick Himmon. The Alan Walton painting, which stands out for its powerful impact, was inherited by the owner. The price of these individual paintings will leave you in awe. I think five to eight thousand pounds. I think a thousand fifteen hundred for that. Yeah. Being such a private artist. Around a thousand pounds, thousand fifteen hundred, something like that. I must say, at least ten to fifteen thousand pounds. You know. I'm very surprised. A teapot that used to be an ornament in the owner's house was actually a valuable piece. It was a teapot called Bones the Butcher, created by Clarice Cliff, a famous ceramic artist in 1928. She collaborated on this piece with Joan Shorter, her boss's daughter. Despite a little crack on the handle. The teapot's value stunned the owners. Bones the Butcher is worth 800 to 1,000 pounds. Oh, 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 my God. Oh, wow. That's brilliant. <laughs> this rare item, a Fender Telcaster guitar, was originally used by the owner's father. And he also liked French music. He played in the Dixie Ramblers back in 1933. This is the reissued CD. Right, yeah. That's him right there. The guitar was crafted by Teddy o Gomez with his initials and a date of November 8, 1951, found on the neck pocket. The original guitar of this style was made in 1950, so there was probably a hundred of this guitar made in 1950. The unique feature of this guitar is its left-handed configuration, possibly one of the earliest of its kind. Some of the features of this guitar that are unusual, number one, it's a left-handed guitar. They made far fewer left-handed guitars than they did right-handed guitars. Despite some signs of wearing and repairs, including finished touch-ups and a missing switch tip, the item is remarkably well-preserved. Appraised at thirty to $35,000, its rarity contributes to its substantial value. Wow. A rare cypress wood table from Abeville, Louisiana, was passed down through the owner's family. The owner's father acquired it from his cousin's grandfather, who worked on it at the courthouse in the early 19th century. The table is identified as a rare piece of Louisiana furniture. The thing that is so compelling for me is that it is all made out of this cypress wood. Yeah, it's gorgeous. The table has a French feel and features rare brasses on the front. The other thing I'll point out is these very rare brasses on the front. I wasn't sure about that. Yeah, yeah. And, and they are brass and, and period to the piece. Okay. Uh, I would date this from about 1825 wow. uh, to 1850. Despite being stored for years and showing signs of use, the table was appraised at an estimated three to $5,000. Oh man, this has been a blast. These are sketches drawn by Michael Jackson during the 1972-73 school year when the owner was in art class with him in Encino. The sketches feature a signed Charlie Chaplin drawing and a woman believed to be Jackson 5's tutor. And I asked him who it was and I couldn't remember who it was and I had an opportunity to present these pictures to Jermaine Jackson and he told me that this looked like one of the tutors that they would go around on tour with. Michael Jackson signed both sketches when the owner's father told her to ask him. And so I got home and my dad said, that should probably be signed. And he sent me back to school and I had him sign it and he just picked up a crayon and signed Michael Jackson. It's believed that the Chaplin drawing was a very special sketch since Michael Jackson often compared himself to Chaplin throughout his life. 
In 1995, he recorded a Chaplin song called Smile for his history album. The appraiser also emphasizes the size of the sketch and the clear signatures. A couple years back, there was a painting by Michael Jackson. He did at the age of nine of Charlie Chaplin, and that did all right. But these are larger. They're very clear. The signature on both of them is very nice. Which gives the sketches auction value between eight and ten thousand dollars. Oh, that's great. That's awesome. Thank you. The guest father was a real hero. The guest brought a North Korean flag to the antique roadshow with a special story. The blotches in the 1950 flag show that it was hand-woven by local Koreans of that time. The guest revealed that his dad was in the Marines during World War II and a CIA agent during the Korean War. This was when his father and his men bravely took these flags while taking Seoul from North Korea. The appraiser notes that the flag is just one of a handful of Korean War souvenirs that exist today. Considering the history and form of the item, the appraiser reveals that this is a rare item. We have a note here that says North Korean flag liberated from the flagpole in Seoul, Korea by the 5th Marine Regiment, 1950. With that, the appraiser gave the flag a value ranging from $2,000 to $2,500. Wow. That's great. That's great, yeah. This woman brought an ancient Chinese mushroom called Ling Shi. She was a collector of Chinese and Japanese stones and was able to purchase it from another collector for just $40. She didn't even know what it was and just thought it was a beautiful natural piece. The appraiser revealed that the Ling Shi came in multiple sizes and is associated with health and long life. It painted porcelain, carvings on jade, images and paintings. It has a connotation of long life. This is a fantastic sample because of its unique fan shape and texture, which connotes its age. But you can see the back of it has uh -huh. that kind of color that you see on a lot of mushrooms. Uh -huh. They come across such a nice big specimen. To the guest's delight, the estimated value of the ancient mushroom ranges from an unbelievable $800 to $1,200. Wow. This guest brought this painting drawn by the renowned artist, Francis Gillot, the French artist also known as Picasso's lover. She bought it at a PBS auction four decades ago. The appraiser can confirm the authenticity because of the artist's signature and a gallery label on the back. This artist was introduced to painting by her mother at a young age. However, her relationship with Picasso influenced her artwork. Despite this influence, she later developed her own style. This piece is valued at a shocking $20,000. Really? Oh, you're kidding. I only paid $125 for it. I can't believe it. The guest inherited these beautiful Victorian-era earrings from her great aunt. However, she didn't know what stones were in the earrings. The appraiser took one look at the earrings and revealed that the earrings were British and made of chased gold. The appraiser then notes that the stone is made of Chalcedony and dates back to the mid-1800s, which means that the stones were not Victorian. The appraiser then revealed that these earrings were day and night earrings, which are perfect for different fashionable occasions. Only slight problem is that they were clearly repaired back in the day. This assessment, the appraiser gave the fabulous earrings a value of $1,500. However, if she gets them repaired again, the value of these beautiful earrings will rise to $3,000. The guest had the pleasure of presenting us with the bird commemorative quilt. The commemorative quilt was made by local nuns around the world. Famous explorer Richard Bird carried out on an expedition to the South Pole in 1928. The guest revealed that he acquired the quilt after buying the nuns' property for $1,000 when the nuns' academy shut down. The appraiser was fascinated with the commemorative quilt, especially because Bird was a famous explorer and the quilt was in perfect condition. Convinced about what a fantastic item the quilt was, the appraiser valued it $5,000. So did you get inspired so you're going to take up quilting now that you see how? No, I'm just going to try and buy his share. <laughs> but I, I hate to have him know what you guys are afraid of. Well, I, I think he's going to find out. <laughs> The guest present us with a trio of modern art paintings by renowned artist Sol LeWitt, who is her husband's friend after serving with him in the Korean War. The guest revealed that she received the paintings as a wedding present from the renowned artist. The appraiser was immediately impressed by the paintings because, to his knowledge, this was the renowned artist's earliest work from his students' days. Following his service in the Korean War and studying at art in New York, LeWitt was influenced by his time working in a museum. Now LeWitt is considered to be one of the most renowned modern artists thanks to his minimalist style. Although the guest confirmed it was a LeWitt because he wrote a letter to her offering to buy the paintings back. With the letter, the appraiser gave each painting a decent value, ranging from $7,000 to $10,000 each, making them worth $30,000 together. 
All right, all right. The guest is easier to know the value of her vintage bags and cases. The guest had acquired these items and nearly 1,000 more during the auction shortly after her marriage in the early 70s. The appraiser was delighted by the elegant items, especially as some of them dated back to the 1910s. He could not ignore their style and glamour that exudes from the vintage bags. There was even bags that went on ladies' fingers. Impressed by these items, the appraiser gave him an impressive value of 5,000 pounds. Oh my God, oh right. And I've got three daughters speeding towards the house now. The guest presented the show with a thank you gift from a dear friend, Remy de Hanin, the mayor of St. Bartholomew. De Hanin was a pilot who flew from island to island looking for the spoils of sunken ships in the area. After coming across a sunken ship, he explored it with the world-famous Jacques Cousteau. This was intriguing to the appraiser, who commented on the time and effort spent by Cousteau on similar expeditions. The appraiser was intrigued by potentially 17th to 18th century earthenware pottery. Considering the nature of the pottery and the story behind how it was obtained, the appraiser gave the collection a value ranging from $100 to $150. This guest came to the show with two sets of Falk book form cases. The guest revealed that he received the gift from his mother's uncle, who was a world traveler with a great collection. The appraiser was intrigued by both French Falk books, the first of which was a Fox book hiding a music box with a stunning decanter. The appraiser also confirmed that the second Fox book was a poker set that came with an amazing set of shot glasses. He noted the items dated back to late Victorian to Edwardian period and was impressed about how the sets were in great condition. Impressed, the appraiser valued the box at $300 to $500, while the bigger one was valued at about $500 to $800. Excellent. Yeah. All right. The next guest presented us with an antique map of England that her mother found in an antique store. The guest was interested in the map because she had found some nuns tearing old books before coloring them when she was in Edinburgh. The appraiser confirmed that this was a special map because it was made in the 17th century by an Englishman named John Speed, at a time only Dutchmen made maps. Maps like this became popular because of the color which came from the map was extracted from an atlas. This became common practice because of how profitable colored maps became in the 17th century. Considering the factors, the appraiser valued the antique map at a range of $2,000 to $2,200. Really? This guest was pleased to present the show with the first African-American beauty book written by Madame C.J. Walker. Apparently, she received it from a friend who thought she might enjoy the book as a hairdresser. The appraiser confirmed that this was indeed a book by C.J. Walker's School of Beauty Culture. Although textbooks were not interesting in the antique world, the appraiser was intrigued by the fact that it was an early beauty book for African-American women. Upon closer inspection, it turned out the book was the first book published for styling and fashion for African-American women. Interestingly enough, it turned out that C.J. Walker, who was originally known as Sarah Breedlove, was the first child born after the emancipation of slavery in the U.S. Furthermore, she was the first female African-American self-made millionaire. Considering what a fantastic piece of history this is, the appraiser valued the book at at least $10,000. $10,000? Are you serious? I am serious. Oh, you're kidding. No, I'm not. $10,000? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> this young man presented the show with jewelry that he inherited from his mother's cousin, who inherited them from their grandmother. The appraiser was immediately intrigued by a ruby-laden 18-carat Cartier Compact, which was dated back to the 40s. That didn't stop her from noticing the second item, an Art Deco black enamel Cartier Compact, which dated back to 1925. The third case was even more interesting because it was an Ostertag Meander, which dated back to the 1930s. To the guest's delight, the first Cartier Compact was valued at anything between three to five thousand, while the Black Art Deco case was valued at a range of six to eight thousand. Finally, the Ostertag Meander was valued at a range of fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. That's amazing. This guest informed us that she and her husband received the Sugar Bowl as a wedding gift from her aunt. Considered to be a family heirloom, the family had been unable to decipher the coat of arms carved into the Sugar Bowl. Furthermore, it's believed that the top wasn't the original one. Interestingly enough, the appraiser was quickly able to determine that the sugar bowl was made from American colonial silver. Even more intriguing, it was made by Paul Revere Jr., the silversmith and American folk hero. Considering what a fantastic piece of history this is, the appraiser valued the sugar bowl between ten dollars to $20,000 because it didn't have its original top. If it had its original top, it would have been valued at an amazing $58,000. Next up, this guest presented us with a painting of a local woman named Miss Sanderson. 
She was the wife of Mr. Anderson, the owner of an art shop in Richmond that many local artists converged in upon close analysis. The appraiser was quick to notice that the painting was a mixture of watercolor and body color. The appraiser also noticed that the painting is an Italian divisionist painting. Considering how unusual the painting was, the appraiser believed the painting was worth 1,000 to 1,500 pounds. Our guest inherited this bronze statue from the French side of her family. Upon closer analysis, the appraiser revealed that the sculpture was carved by Joseph Bernard, a 19th century modern classical sculptor. Apparently, this sculpture is one of the artist's most famous pieces of work, known as Jean Filet avec une cruche, also known as Young Girl with a Jug. Considering to be one of the pioneers of art deco, the sculpture represented the movement towards this style of work. Considering the beauty of this sculpture, the appraiser was delighted to announce that it could be sold for anything between 15,000 to 40,000 pounds. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Oh my goodness, well that's quite something for the family because she is a family piece and we are so lucky.